and this is David Sloan Wilson with our newest episode of uh, Evolution and Contextual Behavioral Science, a Reunification. And uh, this one is on uh, organizational development. And I'm very pleased to introduce three uh, distinguished people. Uh, the first is Frank Bond. Hello, Frank. Hello. Um, and you are a director, of, uh, inst a director of the Institute of Management Studies at Goldsmiths at the University of London. And then um, uh, Jean Wilhelm, known as J.W. Stolhorst. Hello, uh, J.W. Hello. And you are uh, Associate Professor of Strategy and Organization at the University of Amsterdam. And then uh, Mark Van Vucht. Hello, Mark. Hi, David. And you are Professor of Evolutionary Psychology and Work and Organizational Psychology at the Free University of Amsterdam. And as your title suggests, all of you are insiders in a sense, uh, working in departments that are all about organizational um, uh, psychology. And yet at the same time, you're outsiders in terms of your uh, perspectives, ranks from the perspective of acceptance and commitment training, and JW and Mark uh, from the perspective of, uh, of um, evolution. Uh, you've all actually know quite a bit about each other's areas. And so I, I look forward to this as being a a very well-informed conversation. So uh, Frank, why don't you begin by just describing yourself uh, very briefly, and then uh, we'll do the same for JW and Mark. Well, it's it's kind of interesting because this um, summarizes kind of my thinking since I was a child. I've always liked um, evolution when we learned it in school, and I can remember, and I may be wrong, uh, you know, that the key components of evolution, I didn't even look at this um, before I came on because it's what had inspired me. It's basically you need reproduction, variation, and then a kind of selection uh, by uh, more competition by natural selection. Um, I always liked that. And we also learned something uh, in history uh, during World War I, uh, Winston Churchill wasn't doing very good. And um, he said that you have to, um, you know, uh, well, he, he said lots of different things and I have written it down someplace to remind myself, but that if you fail, the important thing is to keep going so that you just keep going. And if you're successful, you will not stay successful. You have to keep at it. And this kind of uh, aligned me with uh, looking at people like Skinner, who looked at action and consequences. And I was very interested in that and decided to do uh, my work in psychology and went in England to the only two places that did um, behavioral psychology at the time, uh, University College London. Uh, and also at the University of London was the Institute of Psychiatry. And I chose UCL because of its functional contextualism. And I loved it. And then I went on to do, I knew I wanted to do my PhD in both clinical psychology and organizational psychology because I've always wanted to combine the two. My goal has always been to say, can we find some sort of psychological mechanism that uh, runs across human behavior? And I liked that from the evolutionary point of view that it gives you the ability to do that potentially. Um, and uh, there, there are problems with behaviorism. I think ACT kind of helps to address that and especially relational frame theory. So I was very much caught up into that and contacted Steve Hayes in the mid nineties to start seeing what we could do. Uh, and so throughout my career, I've been looking at ACT in the workplace, both individually but also in teams uh, through organizational development and also through uh, not only people who are suffering perhaps, but also people who are elite performers. So over the past six years, 
I've been working with people who are um, are Olympians in um, Team GB and uh, with uh, major executives. And at the moment, with our uh, civil servants at the Foreign Office, who are very, 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 very clever people, um, and who are being asked to do something extraordinary at the moment, that is, get us out of the EU. And uh, it's funny, I was at a meeting yesterday, and they said, well, you can't change that because, of course, in 1320, Richard II said you must not do this. But then there was a big debate on what must, how that was used. So who do you find to do that? Now, they think of things that I would never think of or that any one of us would. Uh, and what was interesting to me is, can we see relationships, which we do, between high levels of psychological flexibility or variation and performance? How do we account for that? How can we change that? How can we use that in organizations? And so that's really been you know, the goal of not only my career, but in starting and running uh, this institute that I've begun at the university. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so uh, JW, your turn. Okay, so I'm trained in management, uh, really. So I'm a business school person, that's where I grew up. And uh, I very much see the, the strategy and organization field as the, the, the field that I do research in and that I certainly do most of my teaching in. And studying uh, strategy in relation to technological change was my PhD topic, but basically brought me into contact with some evolutionary theory. And of course, not having really been trained in that, uh, this started as it does with a lot of people studying technological change with a metaphor. So the idea is that technology changes basically in similar ways as you would find uh, evolution take place in, uh, in nature. And uh, when I was doing the PhD about 20 years ago, there, there were people that were beginning to take this more and more uh, seriously. And I remember being invited uh, just as a finishing PhD student to an epistemology group, an evolutionary epistemology group in England. And people like, uh, uh, I think his first name was John Zyman, trying to really see how far they could push this metaphor. And uh, at the same time, I was reading a little bit of evolutionary economics. I'm not an economist by training, but I've sort of become a, an amateur economist by now. And, and the evolutionary economists were also basically trying to look at this metaphor of evolution in relation to technological change, but also in relation to economic growth. And they had some things to say about firms. Being in a management uh, uh, discipline and being in a business school, what they had to say about firms was also relatively limited. And so from there on, I've sort of started developing this, this, this interest in, in seeing how far this metaphor would go. And in that process also started meeting people like Jeffrey Hodgson, uh, who were really saying, this is not a metaphor. There, there yeah. is something much deeper there. And uh, by then, I think I, I sort of picked up on that myself. I wasn't so research active at the time. I was doing lots of executive work and management training. And, and somehow what I'd been reading rang uh, true with what, what Jeff Hodgson was saying, that there, there really is something much more fundamental about evolution as a general concept. And so about 15 years ago, when I moved to my current university, I really started doing much more research, started working on these sorts of questions, uh, did some writing on, on evolutionary epistemology and what it means if we use an evolutionary explanation, if we build an evolutionary explanation in the social sciences, what, what does an explanation like that look like? And I've, I've been doing that sort of work for, for, for a while now, interacting with people that, uh, that had that sort of interest mostly in, in a little bit in the biology of philosophy and in evolutionary economics. But at the same time, trying to sort of, you know, wanting to bring that back to, to how you look at firms. And in that process, the, the work I was doing was relatively philosophical and abstract. What is an evolutionary explanation? There was this other half, I would say, of what I would now see as my research. And the other half was that, that you are talking about firms yeah, as, as adaptive, complex adaptive systems that evolve and adapt in relation to competition. But, but within those firms, the building blocks are people. 
And of course, there's a whole branch of, of evolutionary research in the social sciences, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary anthropology, that really, really looks at the behavioral level of, of how people behave. And, and that has sort of become the second pillar, so to speak, of, of how, how I think of myself as a, as a management researcher, but also as, I hope, an evolutionary social scientist, which is the sort of the behavioral foundations of that whole story. And uh, that's sort of been, the, I would say, the last five, six years, the, probably the main focus of, of my thinking and writing. And, and uh, basically the idea there would be to also have a good grasp of, of what the human material is that we are trying to build these organizations with. And if we know that better, I think we can design better organizations, which ultimately is you know, the sort of stuff I teach in a business school. But in order to be able to do that, we have to understand who and what we are as, 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 as people. And uh, I think uh, that's probably the last thing that, that I want to say by way of introduction. If you're in a business school, it's almost a microcosm of the social sciences. So there's people with economic backgrounds, there's people with psychology backgrounds, there's people with anthropology, sociology, what, what have you. Everything is there. And then, then they're trying to say something about this phenomenon that I would say is central to our modern uh, world, firms, uh, especially business firms. Of course, we talk about organizations more widely, but, but there is a bit of a focus certainly in my strategy field on, on business firms. But we don't really have an interpretive way of looking at a paradigm to, to really build on. And, and I think that's ultimately what drew me to the evolutionary theory more and more and more. And I think that these two pillars, that, that if we look at things like firms, which are, of course, a collective phenomenon, we, well, we are looking at adaptive complex systems, but we are looking at adaptive complex systems that have humans in them that we can say a lot about in terms of yeah, our dispositions, our genetic dispositions. And some, somehow in between the two, there is yeah, our instincts, our genetic dispositions, there's the firms, and in between there is a layer of culture that we're trying to manage. And th that is sort of how, how I've developed my evolutionary thinking and, and applying it to firms. But as the, as the latest step in the last two, three years, trying to think of how we can manage firms as moral communities and, and get a little bit away from the homo economicus model, maybe something we can discuss later in the... Oh, yeah, we will. <laughs> about. Uh, Mark, it's your turn. All right, well, I'll uh, keep it brief uh, because I think I've in been introduced in a previous interview already, but um, I'm a professor in uh, psychology. So my background is actually in experimental social slash organizational psychology, uh, which was in the Netherlands where I started in the uh, late uh, 80s and early 90s. And uh, I do remember our um, um, philosophy of psychology classes where we discussed everyone from Freud to Rogers and to Kant and Hegel but we didn't get to Darwin uh, surprisingly um, and it was really only much later when my interest in, in Darwin uh, and evolution uh, uh, developed uh, which, which actually was when I started uh, studying as part of my PhD the evolution of um, cooperation so um, my PhD was on, on sustainability issues and how to change people's behaviors uh, to um, act more pro-environmentally. And um, I used a little bit of game theory, um, but I wasn't really aware of uh, any of the models of the evolution of, uh, of cooperation and, and pro-sociality there. Uh, it was only when I started working in the UK in 1995 when uh, that interest uh, developed. And um, that was partly through the work of Eleanor Ostrom, from very familiar to you, of course, on um, governing the commons, uh, where um, basically um, um, the interest uh, uh, of her and, and mine uh, developed towards finding institutional uh, solutions to the kind of cooperative problems that small communities faced. Um, and so uh, thus far, nobody had really been interested in looking at these institutional solutions to social dilemmas. And so from there, I started developing an interest in leadership as one way to solve a collective action problem. Um, and of course, uh, organizations, uh, in, in organizations, leaders are very important. And, and maybe the one 
uh, um, biggest challenge that uh, managers have to solve in organizations is solve these social dilemmas. So that's where I started doing experiment leadership, what kind of leadership works, doesn't work. And I also started to look uh, more carefully at a comparative approach to leadership, looking for example at how um, uh, other groups of animals, be it uh, chimpanzees, hyenas, dolphins, uh, social insects, start um, 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 solving these kinds of uh, social dilemmas. Um, and then after a spell in the UK, I moved back to the Netherlands, where I took up on a position in organizational psychology. And there, of course, is a field that is wide open for um, evolutionary approaches. And if you look at um, the textbooks in work and organizational psychology, there's very little of it. And there's really very little um, trying to understand the sort of ultimate reasons why people uh, have developed organizations, how they turn them into cooperative units, what role in managers to play in solving these kind of social dilemmas. And so um, that's really what I'm trying to do in my um, current position. Um, and as part of that, we've established what is called a leadership lab, where people from different disciplines, based on a sort of evolutionary approach, start looking at how you can get teams of leaders in boardrooms to make more effective decisions in their organizations. That's really what I'm um, currently doing at the moment. And I've teamed up with uh, JW because um, we have complementary um, uh, um, um, knowledge, I think, about organizations. I'm looking more at the individual side, individual psychology, the leadership psychology, and JW is looking more at the, the uh, macro side, how organizations function, how they adapt, etc. And I, we thought that that interplay would be a, 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 could be a contribution to this um, to this book. So that's uh, yeah. my way of mind. That's great. That's great. And uh, we'll link to the webinar that we did on your book, Mark, uh, um, so that um, uh, the viewers of this webinar can can see that one. Well. In, in your personal introductions, you I think you've introduced your chapters to a degree, but uh, let me have you uh, summarize uh, briefly so we can get on to our give and take discussion. Um, the um, uh, the chapters you wrote for for this book, and uh, once again, uh, Frank, let's begin with uh, let's begin with you. Well, I um, I really come to all of this from uh, an acceptance and commitment therapy point of view, also from a relational frame theory point of view and contextual behavioral science as a whole. So that is my, that's my work uh, to which I apply to individuals and organizations. What links me, I think, to the evolutionary perspective is on the concept of variation, uh, the importance of that. And this is something that is very interesting because it's something that many areas of psychology, many different um, philosophies, disciplines, uh, don't really pick up on uh, because they don't focus on behavior as much as you know, behavior therapy does. And so I think that's the main link there. And we can see it very easily in ACT in trying to see how we can change people's behavior so that they get reinforced, change people's behavior so that they're consistent with the values that they have. Now, um, the evolutionary theory may not speak to values, but they are the um, consequences by which people are able to live uh, kind of successful and happy lives. So I can see kind of the combination there. Uh, the problem with humans uh, is that we think. Um, or <laughs> and, and I thought the problem was that we don't think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's a combination of two. And um, so we think and we know what to do if we're, say, if we're talking about an individual and they have obsessive compulsive disorder. Well, it's really quite clear what to do. Just walk out of the damn house without, you know, checking the stove five times. Uh, that doesn't happen. And uh, we have to 
address what we think, what we feel, the urges, the memories that we have. So how do you do that? Uh, we, I think ACT brings to uh, the action part uh, this concept of mindfulness, of being in the here and now, and having, the, uh, having an ability to observe what we're thinking and feeling, which I think is actually where we're going in ACT in many ways and in RFT but that's for perhaps a different discussion. But I think those elements allow us to take the actions that we need in order to be able to accomplish the values and goals that we have. Now, what we wanted to do was to scale up those principles. And again, I think that they are, and so psychological flexibility is really at the heart of that, is what we call it. That is the ability to be able to take action uh, towards a meaningful value goal, despite the thoughts, feelings, sensations, or other internal events that you have. So that's the psychological flexibility bit. And it certainly applies, we've seen, and it's a great predictor of uh, mental health issues. We see that it mediates uh, improvements in uh, mental health, all that. But can we expand that into other areas? And my uh, goal over the past 15 years or so has been to see how we can upscale that or scale it up to uh, organizations of various kinds. Because what ACT speaks to at the individual level, I think is very similar to what it speaks to, what it could speak to at the organizational level. That is, we have an organization hopefully has a mission or a vision. And indeed, uh, lots of problems happen when that doesn't happen. Um, you know, we're seeing it now in Britain at the moment where we may have an overall mission to get out of the EU, but not everyone agrees with that. So we have, and I'm talking about in government, so we have two missions, two, we don't have an agreed mission or agreed um, vision, which is very problematic. So we don't even know what we want, yeah? So what actions do we take in order to get to what we don't know what we want. And then comes all of the horror shows with regards to people interacting in bad ways. We get poor job design. We get bad leadership. And ACT can promote very good leadership as well. Uh, we see that in the work we've done with, um, with Olympic coaches uh, that is that if everyone's clear about what they want to achieve, things are easier. And one thing that I think ACT brings as well, in addition to the action, in addition to uh, solving goals and problems and succeeding, is it also brings, dare I say, a human touch. That is that it brings a recognition that we are dealing with human beings. Um, there are times when I question whether my staff are humans, but um, I would say usually they are. And how do I motivate them? How do I get them to work in ways that I want them to and to change? And we've known this in psychology for a long time, and it's to contact them, to get to know them. I often say with leaders um, in other organizations, if you don't know what your direct reports want to do in five years, there's a big problem because you don't know how to help them. You don't know what training to give them. You're not talking with them. 
So I think there is a sense of humanity um, that serves as a motivator that can help leaders and others to motivate people to work towards established goals. And I think the variation going back to evolution, that that may take for some leaders, that flexibility, as we say and act, could be substantial because they're not used to behaving in that way, uh, to being a human at work, uh, never mind agreeing values. So I think that ACT is very consistent with the requirements that evolution points us to in order to um, further change that might be useful. So that's essentially what the book is about and how we can do it, the different ways that ACT does that at an individual level and then showing how we can uh, scale that up to the organizational level. And at the moment, I have a couple of PhD students working now on developing a measure that is able to look at those organizational aspects. We've developed a measure that looks at those psychological flexibility uh, aspects at the individual level, uh, mainly for people who are a little disturbed but that's been terrific in predicting things like mental health, productivity, uh, the number of sales that people make, and um, lots of other behavioral outcomes. So I think that the potential is there. And I think that evolution helps us to um, identify and keep on course the necessity of behavior and selecting what is going to be the most important thing for what we choose to do. So that's hey, it. Let me, let me, thank you, thank you. That was uh, very good. Um, let me provide a little context before um, having um, JW and Mark um, describe uh, their chapters. And this is context for the whole book that uh, what makes um, CBS evolutionary is primarily by treating individuals as evolutionary processes in their own right. That was Skinner's essential insight, basically, that operant conditioning, selection by consequences, is, is producing behaviors in an open-ended fashion in a way similar to genetic evolution. So that means that each and every person is an open-ended evolutionary process. And then that got refined and extended by relational frame theory to include such things as symbolic thought and, um, and language, which really Skinner was unable, unable to explain uh, in terms of uh, operant um, uh, conditioning. Well, a funny thing happened during this process. Um, behaviorism became somewhat excluded from academic psychology, was replaced by the so-called cognitive revolution. And then bizarrely in retrospect, it was opposed by evolutionary psychologists. Um, when that discipline emerged, uh, people like Cosmides and Tubi, who self-consciously distinguished evolutionary psychology from what they call the standard social science model. And so what most people associate with evolutionary psychology has much to do with the mind as a product of genetic evolution. So now we've switched to a genetic time scale. And, um, um, and attempts to explain current behavior in terms of modules, crudely put, that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, more or less um, evolved in an ancestral environment. Now, both of these are correct, but it's a matter of recombining them. And, uh, and, and that's why the re reunification is, uh, is required. And of course, as ACT works its way from individuals to organizations, and as evolutionary psychology works its way more towards providing a theory of cultural evolution, then these things are meeting in the middle. So basically, we need to think about evolution at three timescales, at the personal timescale, at the cultural timescale, and at the genetic timescale. Uh, that's the fully rounded evolutionary approach that we're working towards with this uh, reunification. So with that long-winded interlude, 
uh, uh, JW, would you like to describe uh, your chapter? I'm not repeating anything they've said before, but building upon it. Okay, I will, I will give that a shot. And uh, I, I will probably end where you just ended. Um, this idea about uh, the personal development or cultural development, because uh, that's that's in the end uh, what, what organizations I think are very much about. Yeah, I mean, Mark can fill in at any moment, obviously, but uh, I, I think there's there, there's sort of two parts to the chapter that we did. The first part where basically we wrote down uh, uh, some things that both Mark and I had already written about and that I, I think are sort of the, the general idea of how we could look at organizations. I'll say something about that first. And then we played around a little bit with uh, a, a specific theory, a relatively grand theory by itself, that uh, we try to incorporate into evolutionary uh, theory. And this, this uh, theory is relational models theory by Alan uh, Page Fisker, an, an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the second part of the chapter. So, so let me say something about the first part. Um, uh, and this is basically stuff that, that Mark has been writing about with co-authors that I've written about amongst others with uh, Pete Richardson of uh, gene culture co-evolution. And that, that's just the idea that if we look at modern organizations, uh, for instance, firms, that's the focus in, in this particular chapter that we took, then basically we're just looking at a modern manifestation of something quite fundamental about us as humans, which is our ability to cooperate on a large scale with people that we're not directly related with genetically. And, and this is an important puzzle in evolutionary theory, and especially in going from biology to the social behavioral and social sciences, how, how does cooperation emerge in general and human cooperation in, in particular? And there's all kinds of insights there, I think, from the last, well, um, since, uh, uh, let's say, Hamilton 64 or and, and Trevor 71, there, there's a whole, a, a, a whole development. There's been a lot of discussion. You've been, yeah, David, you've been part of that with multi-level selection. Gene culture co-evolution came in. So we basically build on that. And from that perspective, firms are just a modern manifestation of our ability to cooperate on a large scale non-kin but there's of course a twist yeah um this is a modern context that we're talking about and as evolutionary psychology would say this is where mark is much more the specialist than i am but uh, we do that largely with a stone age mind that's the popular way of putting it so there is an evolutionary mismatch that we're, we're constructing somehow these, these modern environment with, with, with these, these stone age minds so 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 how do we do that exactly and uh, the, the basic idea, this is still the first part of the, of the paper, is that, that we have evolved in our social cognition, in our social and, if you will, moral cognition, all kinds of ways of dealing with, Mark already mentioned them, social dilemmas. And if you have some collective enterprise like a firm or even a small uh, hunter-gatherer group, there's always a tension between what is good for you right, in your short-term self-interest, on the one hand, and what is good for the group, especially in the longer term. On the other hand, so that's the social dilemma. And you know, the prisoner's dilemma is one, one famous example of that, but there, there's this very strong tension. So how do we solve that? Now, game theory would say that it's almost impossible because it makes assumptions about our rationality. But a lot of the empirical evidence shows that we do solve these things very often. And, and, and what is it in our in our minds, about our minds, that, that helps us do that? On the one hand, that's the, basically our, our dispositions as, be, as behavioral entities, as humans. And on the other hand, Mark already mentioned that as well in his introduction, what are the institutional settings or the, or the cultural norms that we, we have that sort of interface with our genetic dispositions in having us cooperate? So, so that's basically the idea of, of how we how we look at firms. I think both Mark, Mark and myself, and from an evolutionary perspective, uh, uh, we're actually much better at solving social dilemmas than standard rational choice theory would have. Uh, but the dilemmas are always there. Uh, there is always a possible problem with free riding. We have to solve this, but we're we're relatively good at it because we have a long evolutionary history where we have all kinds of mechanisms of dealing with that. Now, if you, if you look. Then at firms, then of course the question is, how, how do we do this? And uh, I, I said that I would end sort of, I'm not quite ending yet, but I, I would come back to what you were saying about these three layers of evolution. And the cultural evolution is an important part of that. But, but could it be that there is something universal about culture 
yeah, that, that we can sort of grasp? Could, could there be a theory of, of how culture as, as sort of this inst part of the institutional setting makes us cooperate? And that, that's where this relational modest theory possibly comes in. So what Alan Page Fitz basically claims is that our social psychology, and he also makes a link to moral psychology, basically works through four ideal types frames that we use to structure our social relationships. And they are uh, communal sharing, CS, authority ranking, AR, uh, equality matching, EM, and market pricing, MP. And the idea would then be that each of these models is a way of basically structuring our social relationships. And I would, I would add to that. I don't think that Alan uh, ever thought of it like that himself, but I've, I've been talking about it with him. These four things are then also ways of solving the social dilemmas. And if, if, if that were the case, then one way of looking at firms and how they make us cooperate would be through the lens of these four systems. And that's what we did in, uh, in the chapter. So, so uh, yeah, Martin, nicely done. Martin very if, 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 if in some detail looked at how leadership styles link to these four models. I looked a bit at uh, what in, in management we would call the macro level. This is not the macro level of economists. That's the, the whole whole of society. At, uh, for a management scholar, macro is the, the whole of the firm. I looked a little bit at how firms can be designed so that they make different use of these of these four models. And then the idea is, of course, yeah, you, you try to design firms in such a way, you try to have leadership styles in such a way that they are basically making these firms uh, cooperative communities that can compete well with other firms. All right, so the idea of these four frames, or you could call them modules, is that they're basically forms of social organization that are useful in different contexts. And so more or less people are good at one of the four frames uh, comes naturally to us, and uh, and it's a matter of, of matching the right frame to the right, uh, to the right situation. Is that is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I would say. And Mark Mark may have additional thoughts, but also having discussed this in some detail by, now by with 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 Alan Page Fisk himself, the the idea is that we all are able to use each of these frames. My personal feeling is, and I think there's some backup from that, from, from behavioral research, that each of us may have a predilection more towards one of the four. So some people may be more CS-minded on average than uh, 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 AR-minded, uh, uh, more group-minded than authority-minded. But I think uh, what what uh, uh, social psychologists would call strong situational cues can move us in any of these frames. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the uh, interesting things in, in, in looking at what business schools do is that we, when we are teaching, and I, I'm doing that, so half of my time I'm, I'm teaching strategy and organization, we're, we're giving our students a lot of um, MP, market pricing type of thinking. And I think we're sort of predisposing uh, their minds, but also the organizations that, that are out there, that we are organizing, that managers are organizing. We're, we're tending to predispose them more and more towards MP. And it's, it's an open question if that's always a good idea. Yeah? It's an open question if we shouldn't think, um, and I have, my, I have my opinions about this, if we shouldn't uh, think a little bit more about firms as moral communities, and if that couldn't make them more successful, which is what I would focus on as a strategy scholar, but maybe also would make us as members of those organizations happier to make the link back to what Frank was talking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mark, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I think, I mean, going back to the, um, uh, the issues that uh, Frank mentioned, uh, so, so one of the um, implications of what we're saying is that, uh, yes, there may be psychological flexibility, for example, among um, workers in a firm, but um, the context is also very important. And if uh, the organizational culture, for example, um, is uh, geared towards a particular frame of a relationship. So for example, market pricing, whereby you say, well, okay, uh, we give out um, um, individual rewards for performances. We give uh, bonuses when people perform well on an individual level. And when they don't do so well, we punish them. If that is the frame within, within 
which you work as an organization, if that is the culture, which is maybe conveyed by the leaders, the managers, then it's very hard for uh, employees to um, fit in who have a different kind of relationship in mind. For example, it's very hard then to get them to do any uh, voluntary service for the organization. Right? We call them OCBs, for example. And that is where maybe there is some limits to the flexibility that we have as workers in organizations. Right? We have a dominant mode, which is the sort of cultural uh, mode of the organization. And that may or may not fit very well with the demands and needs of the workers. And that, in our view, creates some sort of cultural mismatch uh, with which uh, organizations will have to cope. Uh, yes, and um, I, I would agree entirely. And indeed, we published research in which we've shown that, um, that in quasi-experimental designs, that uh, when we redesign aspects of organizations, that uh, psychological flexibility, in fact, moderates the impact that that design has on outcomes. Uh, so, you know, we do think that uh, things like, you know, things that have been shown to predict uh, motivation and productivity, Hackman and Oldman's, you know, material on autonomy and skill variety and role clarity. Role clarity is something that we're increasingly seeing as a problem. You know, what, that is that, is, uh, what is that, Frank? Role clarity really means what oh, role clarity. Yeah, okay. what, do I, what do I do? What do yeah. I do? So, I mean, and uh, that may seem odd, but, you know, if you go into a tech startup or someplace else, small organizations or very big ones, it, people don't know what they do. And so we know that people do not work well, or most people do not work well under certain situations. Um, and again, it's probably, you know, we see that uh, across the world and that's probably from an evolutionary point of view, I'd imagine, you know, uh, giving people autonomy is extraordinarily important. Um, we also know that certain uh, human resource principles uh, over monitoring people is not good at all. Uh, people don't like that. Um, so we're, we're very much aware of that in the context of psychological flexibility. And indeed, what we have hypothesized and what we're looking at now, and what we, indeed what we've seen in some of our research is that leaders who are uh, what we would call transformational leaders, uh, that is people who try to um, as we put it, understand the needs and values of their employees and see to the degree they can match them in a way to what the organization is trying to do, that those people, those leaders, can actually enhance the psychological flexibility of the workers themselves. And it's that increase in the workers' psychological flexibility that can actually lead not only to their better mental health, but to their better performance as well. So I agree that we have to look at this in the whole and that merely changing psychological flexibility at the individual level is not going to be sufficient. But what's interesting is the variation uh, that evolutionary principle that is so important in psychological flexibility turns out also normally to be important in the uh, organizational structure, processes, and strategic purposes of the organization as well, which is very interesting, I think. Let me, let me focus on monitoring, because that's one of the core design principles, according to Eleanor Ostrom, for groups working well. If you can't monitor agreed upon behavior, then forget about it. Uh, but you just said that there's bad forms of monitoring and there's over monitoring. And I, I'd like you to maybe elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, presumably, you agree that some kind of monitoring is needed, but, uh, but it can be the wrong kind. So more, please, on that. Sure. Well, um, let's let's take um, uh, call center workers. 
Um, and one, one thing that we did was that um, in one bank, uh, you have a team of cross central workers and they have to get through three types of tasks in the day. So maybe they have to call up uh, people who are late in their payments. They have to call up people who are processing uh, money and then something else. Now, what we often find is that the leader uh, says, okay, I want you all to do it in this order. I'm gonna check up on you at lunchtime to see how things are going. And then we're going to do it, you know, at the end of the day. But what we do know is if we give people more control over how they do their work and we decrease the monitoring that we can do, then we're going to do better. So firstly, um, I am a horrible morning person and there are certain tasks that I do not want to do in the morning. And I will be in a grouchy mood and I'm not going to like it. So can I do that in the afternoon after lunch? I, I'm going to like that better. So also, basically providing, providing elbow room for people to do the job, that'll be monitored. But to do it their way, um, uh, that's, that they should have the elbow room to do that. That's right. And perhaps they work faster in the afternoon as well. So that if they need to step outside in the morning to call the school because the headmistress wants to talk to, you know, um, the parent about little Johnny, then um, she or he are go is going to be able to make up that time later on in the afternoon when he or she tends to work faster. So that you still have the monitoring that's there but you've also given people control to work in a way that's going to be more desirable for them. And indeed what we find is that decreases absenteeism, uh, performance basically remains the same, uh, and turnover decreases as well. So the monitoring is necessary, but the degree of monitoring and the frequency of monitoring uh, needs to be commensurate with, with the goal of the job. So in many call centers, uh, people will even know when you uh, sit up from your, stand up from your chair um, to go to the bathroom and things like yeah. that. Right. So um, I, 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 I think you have to balance that out. Mark, did you write something to say? Yes, if I may add, uh, I think we're very much uh, on the same page in, in terms of um, that people bring to organizations a set of evolved preferences, which um, are part of our evolutionary uh, legacy, uh, a need for autonomy, for example, a need to be valued and respected, a need to develop your, uh, be able to develop your competence so that you can get prestige, etc. So I think that is what people bring to their jobs and they are probably universal needs and motives. The question I think that we try to answer in our chapter is, is the modern organizational environment a way in which these needs and values and motives can thrive or are there structures that actually impede people to uh, develop these um, motives and needs? And so, um, and, and that's where we say, well, cultures, uh, are experiments. They are um, organizations are also, and firms are experiments. They are ways that people think about uh, the best way to structure the, their work organization, but they're not set in stone. And if environments change, then maybe also structures need to change. Uh, structures need to be aligned to people's uh, motives and needs, and they also need to be responsive to environments. And so what we try to raise is, is there this organizational mismatch whereby the kind of structures that we've created after the industrial revolution are no longer best fitted to what people need and want and how should we retailer and redesign them into the kind of cooperative communities that uh, our ancestors thrived in for probably hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, so let me... Uh, uh uh, nudge their conversation in the following uh, direction. Uh, 
the business and management and organizational literature is a sprawling literature, uh, so much work being done. And also, uh, of course, business is a highly competitive process. So between group competition in the business world is intense. And with what we know about creative destruction and firm selection, uh, ideas and economics like that, you would certainly expect that to act as a crucible for the cultural evolution of businesses that work well. Uh, nevertheless, it turns out that businesses don't always work well. And there's something very new about both of uh, these perspectives, the evolutionary perspective and the, and the CBS perspective. So help me understand kind of the added value. Why, why is it that your perspectives are new against the background of both the sprawling academic study of organizations and the organizations themselves, uh, uh, which aren't working as well as you might expect uh, based on naive um, or at least simple views of creative destruction and firm selection, JW. Yes, I, I think that a lot of what, what is happening in part consciously uh, steered by, by, I would say, certain uh, theories, and in part unconsciously, is, is that we're basically designing organizations very much along the lines of, of, of uh, hardcore neoclassical economic theory, which, which makes all kinds of assumptions about us as humans that uh, have, I think, largely been uh, disproved uh, in all kinds of empirical research. But the, 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 the sort of underlying ideology uh, is, is, is still out there. And um, it's, it's, an, it's an ideology that is not always recognizable, uh, but that's certainly there at the moment that we're uh, focusing all of our attention on these firms performing very well in competitive terms. And especially uh, uh, when it's about them performing well in the terms of the financial markets. So part of the part of the uh, uh, issue, I think uh, that that we haven't mentioned yet is that I think we all three of us, so Frank, Mark, and, and myself, agree that that uh, values are important. I think that's also what I'm hearing Frank say. Uh, um, but of course, the question is which values. Um, if if uh, if it's just about a firm being as profitable as possible and generating as much uh, uh, shareholder value, which is a typical metric that we would use as possible. It, is that going to be a firm that is going to be sort of commensurable with, with, with our, uh, our uh, evolutionary uh, heritage? Uh, uh, at the moment, that we're doing that, we're, we're getting a system that actually could work around, along the, the uh, lines of what Frank was suggesting. There's not too much monitoring. We just basically say, look, be as profitable as possible, and you figure out however you do it. This is how we structure executive compensation very often. They're, they're, nobody's telling these executives how to do it, just as long as they are as profitable as possible, they're going to get a, a, a huge reward. I, th I think what's happening there is that uh, uh, a one particular value uh, is, is taking over from from all the other values. And in, in terms of what we what we um, use in our chapter, the relational models theory, it's all about market pricing. It's all about making these firms as profitable as possible. It's all about basically paying people on the basis of their performance towards this profitability goal. And any other type of value is sort of going out of the window and i think you see this even more uh, strongly in in non-profit firms or at least in the netherlands if you go to schools if you go to the police if you go to the healthcare sector uh, uh, things are being managed on what we can measure what we can measure is all about productivity and we start pushing 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 more and more on the productivity part we start uh, basically rewarding people individually and we're slowly sort of pushing out all the, the, the sort of intrinsic motivation that especially in these non-profit sectors is probably what drove people to work there in the first place. If you talk about healthcare, uh, if you talk about uh, police, if you talk about, uh, about teaching. So 
uh, I think an important part of actually JW you you um you made a little switch there that I want to I want to catch because sure. uh, with a business of course um, they might be trying to maximize shareholder value and so on that's a financial probability that's driving them uh, with these other uh, types of groups than nonprofits it's no longer financial pro uh, profitability but you're saying that something else similar takes hold which is not which is not working. Could you just elaborate on that piece? Yes. Yeah, so in the end, I, th I think those uh, nonprofit organizations also have budget constraints and, and managing organizations in general, I think has very much become a game where it's, it's all about the, uh, these, these financial constraints about the technocratic thinking that goes with it about measuring what you can measure, rewarding people, uh, on that, uh, and basically uh, from the from the top down, designing very specific ways of uh, of doing uh, for people to do their jobs. You you sort of see a, a, a counter you, in the Netherlands. There there is quite a lot of these healthcare organizations that are now turning this around and that are trying to work with self organizing teams. Yeah, then, I've heard about some of them. Yeah. Then you get the sort of things that Frank I think uh, was describing. Uh, that's uh, basically productivity, if anything. Yeah, uh, uh, goes up certainly won't go down, and that certainly the uh, uh, the, the happiness of these workers uh, goes up. And uh, my basic point in 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 this whole story is that uh, I don't think that the economic thinking uh, is 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 bad by itself, not at all. I mean, uh, it has brought us a lot of welfare, but I think that we've gone overboard in having this one particular perspective, and that especially in business schools, we tend to really put that. At the forefront, everything else follows from that, certainly in a field like my own fit strategy and organization. And we're pushing out all these other kinds of things, in part because the starting point for all of this is something that goes back to Adam Smith. We're all homo economicus. That's not a bad thing as long as the market has the free hand. We'll still maximize our collective welfare. And I don't think that's true within organizations. Mark. If, if I can just um, add to that, uh, and this is a project that I'm uh, currently interested in, and that is the appeal of these non-hierarchical organizations, which you see uh, blossoming left and right, eh? the sort of startups uh, in uh, software, for example, uh, but also in uh, the healthcare, as uh, Jan Willem uh, JW said, in Buurtzorg, etc. So there seems to be a, um, uh, an interest in um, these non-hierarchical, bossless organizations. Um, um, people are talking about them, people enjoy or indicate that they enjoy working in them. Uh, productivity is high, uh, satisfaction is high. Um, the question is, well, is this just a modern fad, a fashion trend, or does it reflect something deeper about human nature and human motivation? And that's what I'm currently struggling with um, in a project that I do with uh, some organizational design folks. And some of them are saying, well, these non-hierarchical organizations are nice. They fit people's needs, etc. But they're also limited in scale. And as soon as you scale up organizations and give them more complex tasks than only... Uh, develop this kind of um, uh, um, little machine or a little plug or something like that. As soon as they become more complex, they have more complex activities. They uh, not only do this little tiny bit of machinery, but they build a whole machine. Then you have to scale up the organizations. And that is when they think hierarchies start to emerge almost naturally. So that's... I would think that, uh, I would think that structure... Um emerges. I mean, you certainly have to add structure as you get larger, but whether that structure is hierarchical, and even if it is hierarchical, there can be a bottom-up control in addition to top-down control. There's a difference. I mean, you take Toyota, for example, a very famous example, which succeeds by putting the executives on the shop floor rather than on the top floor, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's known examples of, of giant corporations that, of course, they have structure, and of course, they have hierarchy of the sort, but they also have bottom-up controls uh, that uh, that that are not the typical command and control hierarchy that we that we that we think of. I didn't mean to cut you off, Mark. Do you have more to say? Example. 
Gore-Tex, Semco, those organizations, they use some of these uh, evolutionary lessons to design their their structures. Yeah. 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 Uh, Grant, do you have anything you want to add to the what's the added value of this approach? Why is it why is it why is it so new? Uh, me. I guess yes. I mean I, I, I think for, for one thing, I think that, um, you know, we are now beginning to want to treat our employees better. I mean, you read books on the East India Company, the British East India Company, and on, uh, you know, the major successes of um, the British you know, um, industrial Re revolution and the American, I'm sure. And those were nice places to work. Um, you know, you, um, the problem was, and I feel stressed, it was, I died. Um, <laughs> and, and the, um, you know, they, they, whether or not, you know, an employee had a problem really didn't matter. It was all about the money. It still is, um, you know, for organizations about the money, about shareholder value and all of that. The thing that I think you're seeing is how organizations are adding to that. So they value shareholder money. What else do they value? You know, do they value being part of their community? And if so, how do they value that? So you have some place like salesforce.com, which is probably the most successful, um, you know, consumer, res uh, consumer resource management um, cloud computing firm in the world. Um, and they make a shed load of money. Uh, but what they also do is based in San Francisco, they try to put a lot of money into it. They uh, support just this uh, past month, uh, the Gay Pride, uh, you know, uh, kind of movement there by giving about $10 million to various events related to that. They uh, try to understand what people, their employees value and how they can do that. They give people a half a day off a week to pursue a charitable goal that they have. I think that's what you're seeing. I think the smarter organizations are not stopping to acknowledge or, you know, or acknowledging that yes, we need to make more money, or, but how can we also fulfill the values that our employees have as well? Yeah, so I want to end up with two big questions. Let me list both questions. They're um, related to each other, and then we can uh, uh, step through them. I think, uh, of course, it's it's exciting to discover that an organization that does become organized in this compassionate way, basically, for example, by doing very well by its employees can work better as an organization. And so it's a, it is possible to do well by doing good. And uh, you provide an example, there's many others basically, is that, um, um, uh, so uh, this, is, this is really encouraging. But one reason why it doesn't happen more often, I think is boils down to multi-level selection uh, and the fact that uh, often uh, a company is organized for the benefit of um, the elites within that uh, company is working great for them. But why do we see this concentration of wealth? And so multi-level selection is taking you that you know, we think of cheating and things like that. We think of the, the staff member that's slacking or, or calling in sick or something like that. But really, you know, maybe it's the CEO or the CEO and the shareholders just extracting, extracting, extracting from the company. Good for them, not necessarily good for the company. And of course, they're not going to want to give up control. And you can think of homo economicus as all that as basically an ideology that serves that purposes. And these folks aren't going to go lightly into the night. So I think that there's something almost revolutionary, I mean, literally revolutionary, about 
the members of organizations that uh, do not have much power uh, resting that power in a sense. And what's going to make that work is if those organizations that do that are in fact competitive, do in fact outcompete the companies that are handicapped and hobbled by disruptive within group processes, first and foremost, among the leadership. So, so uh, let's speak on that. Now, the second one is a question as to how we do scientific research with groups like this, because often uh, companies and nonprofits, organizations like that really don't have a scientific mindset. And the idea that they can be treated as living laboratories is not as simple as it might as it might seem. But first speak to me about the uh, about this uh, kind of multi-level view of, um, of uh, business evolution, which includes this disruptive within group component. Yeah, shall I give that a shot? Because I sort of, I sort of caught us onto the topic uh, in, the, in my, sure. in my comments. Kind of view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 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 the in the management and the strategy literature, there 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 is this uh, long debate between a shareholder or a stakeholder view of things and. Uh, yeah, if, if, if you go into that uh, debate, then there are, of course, also different ideologies in the background. And I, I think we cannot completely get away from the fact that, uh, that, that, that that is the case. And then the question, David, that you're, I think, putting to us is who, who are these different ideologies serving? Who's, who's being served by these different ideologies? And uh, I think that uh, the, the CEOs that you were talking about are a, a historically a relatively recent group to be, I would say, co-opted into this free market ideology. In fact, a lot of the of, of the shareholder thinking, if you look at it in the 1970s, was uh, against CEOs that could do what they want. They were not being controlled enough by shareholders. At least that is what the people pushing this uh, uh, financial market ideology from the 70s onwards thought. So they were going against the managers. Um, uh, now we, we very often think of these managers as being part of the issue because of their big bonuses, but they only are getting these big bonuses because they are being controlled by a governance system that is very shareholder driven. And uh, in the end, uh, they, they have been, I think, co-opted into the interest of the financial markets. And it's not the CEOs as such. Uh, that I, I think are the, the, the center of this ide ideology. They've been co-opted into a, an ideology of free markets and especially free financial markets, because I think free markets are very good. Free financial markets is a completely different sort of story because that's where the ideology kicks in. And yeah, certain okay, so it's a more it's basically it's more systemic than I let on, right? Yes, I, I, I would really say that. And. Um, uh, I, I think somewhere in the piece that I wrote with, with Pete Richardson in, in uh, the, the special issue for Journal of Economic Behavior Organization that you edited, we, we say something like, if you look at this through an evolutionary lens, then if, if I would translate what we said there, we basically said, if you look at it through an evolutionary lens, what you want institutions to do is to keep competition peaceful and leaders honest. And I, I think capitalism has been fairly good not at the time of the East Indies companies, but later, fairly good at making competition more peaceful. But the current system is not very good at keeping leaders honest. Yeah, it needs to be said. It needs to be said that it's not the CEOs themselves. Yeah, it needs to be said that uh, that capitalism can be a good thing. I mean, we do want rapid cultural evolution, and Absolutely. so uh, so uh, most people praise this as as benign capitalism in various forms compassionate capitalism stuff like stuff like that anyone else uh, want to comment on on this well i mean i think that you know the uh, government laws rules all of that are extremely important um you know you can't let a free market just go you know do what it wants um, I don't think that's going to be, you know, it's, it's, it, it, that doesn't work. And I think how you control that will probably vary from culture to culture. 
So when I see how we in the UK try to control certain aspects of companies, that's very different from what we see in Malaysia or indeed in um, uh, Thailand. So I think that has to be, we have to think about that. Um, and then within organizations with the leaders, the leaders are you know, just extraordinarily important and selecting those leaders are very important too. One thing that we haven't talked about, which organizational psychologists are very keen to talk about is the whole process of selection. You know, how do we select the leaders and indeed anyone uh, that we have in a company? That is very, very important. Um, and what, what are the values against which we select those people? What are the competencies against which we select those people? That's very important. And I think we're making progress uh, in getting people to change, but people don't like change. Um, more British sailors died of scurvy um, from about 1400 through 16 something. And there was a clever chap at Cambridge who in around 14 something came up with this, um, published his paper, uh, saying that, you know, if they just like suck on a citrus thing for a minute, they're going to be fine. <laughs> and um, the, the Navy, uh, the Royal Navy implemented that 200 years later. So, um, you know, it's kind of as epistemology, you know, I'm an admiral, I know what's best. I think with the move, at least here towards some evidence-based ways of doing things, we're perhaps uh, making things change a little faster than perhaps they have done in future, but uh, in the past. But I think that's always going to be a uh, difficulty and I think that's where uh, the government comes into play too. So who you vote for uh, and the economy you have is going to have a big uh, deal as to the types of organizations that exist. Well, that's a special contribution of CBS, I think, that um, um, even if everyone wants to do something, even if an individual wants to do something for or even if an organization wants to do something, um, getting from point A to B, uh, putting one foot in front of the other is not at all easy. So change is difficult, as you, as you said, and we need a technology for, for just letting people do what they all want to do, either individually or collectively. Uh, that, I think, is a special contribution of, uh, of uh, ACT and relational frame theory. Go to the evolution side for that. We get into realms that actually most... Uh, most um, human evolutionists don't talk about much, like, you know, Stephen Jay Gould punctuated equilibrium, uh, bow plans, uh, you know, constraints, you know, things that basically are, are interfere with the process of just adapting to, a, uh, adapting to an environment. So, and, I, um, I, and I think Act tries to identify what those are. And I think moreover... Great job. Yeah, and, and, and relational frame theory, I think, is trying to extend that. And that's something that a number of us academics are working on at the moment. So um, we want to identify what those problems are and how we can actually improve further the performance and mental health of people uh, than we've been able to do thus far. Again, yeah. look theory. Well, I've, um, I'm in this business too. I work with groups a lot, uh, have been for a few years and really plunged into the business literature. So I regard myself as a colleague of yours uh, in this subject area. And it's my experience, I'm sure it is yours also, that those groups that I approach um, are in the first place, they don't have a scientific mindset. And in the second, they're so damn busy doing what they're doing on a day by day basis that the idea of getting them to step back and to reflect in any sense, they just, they say, I can't do it. You know, I just, I'm too busy. And, and so 
Um, how do you, uh, first of all, is that a problem? And, and secondly, how do you overcome that so that you could actually, we can actually treat these, these groups uh, as, as laboratories, basically, do, 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 good, do good scientific research um, in this setting, Mark? Yes, yeah, so um, we are um, experimenting a little bit with it in the leadership lab uh, where we invite uh, boardrooms, uh, teams of leaders basically, to uh, subject themselves to a, a scientific uh, approach. And uh, as you say, uh, they're all very interested. They're very curious uh, what uh, methodologies we can offer. But at the same time, they A, don't have the time and B, they don't really like to be... Um, uh, analyzed as groups. They like uh, to be analyzed as individuals and the coaching of the CEOs and the senior management executives. That's, that's all well and good. Uh, but to um, actually study them as they are uh, functioning in teams, it's quite scary uh, to them, uh, we find. And so what we're trying to do is to basically combine a sort of um, uh, individual approach where we look at individual needs and motives of these leaders. Uh, they are, uh, could be in an executive board, for example, or in a supervisory board of a company or a nonprofit organization. So we give them individual feedback, but we also, what we do is we observe a team meeting and then we analyze the team meeting in terms of the kind of communications, all relatively anonymized. So we say something at the group level, at the team level, uh, we can say, for example, something about uh, the participation rate. So is there one individual who's talking the whole time and the others are passively listening but not actively contributing? That's a sort of mirror uh, for many of these uh, boards. And sometimes they don't realize how um, discussions are being monopolized by one individual. And so we give them uh, feedback, which they uh, cherish. And, um, and the other thing really is, I mean, uh, we, we need, of course, their data for scientific purposes. Um, and what we enter in is a sort of a quid pro quo is we say, okay, we have these uh, methods which um, uh, are uh, scientifically proven and we can improve your team functioning um, if you allow us access to your boards and your board meetings. And so far, that seems to be working well. Okay. Uh, I mean... One thing, one thing we do, uh, I, well, I, I do and others, um, is we try to target people, <laughs> individuals within organizations who we think can be key holders, who perhaps not too high, uh, literally wind them and dine them. Um, I have a line in my budget for, um, you know, doing this and uh, ask them what they themselves need. You know, what, how can we help you? Um, and if they're a leader, inevitably, they need to fulfill certain functions and deliverables. We, they, they, and we say we'll do it for free. And uh, we do that. Uh, uh, usually it works. And that is our entry into the organization. Mm -hmm. So we find that that is a nice way of doing things. Uh, you know, kind of turning the tables on them, you know, they wine and dine their customers. Uh, we try to do the same. And uh, I think that can be an effective way of doing things, especially in large organizations. I mean, I think the, 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 the public sector here has no money. You know, that's, yeah, that's another story. But um, I think trying to get at an individual who's keen and showing them, even from a small point of view, how we can help that person can help then increase uh, their willingness to open up and to do, say, quasi-experimental designs and uh, other things. Because as we haven't talked too much about one thing that Contextual Behavioral Science Act wants to do is not just predict outcomes, but actually to change outcomes as well. One of the great things about psychological flexibility is a psychological characteristic is we know that we can change it. 
It's been done in many, many studies. And we have seen too that that change mediates change in outcomes we like. We know that neuroticism, conscientiousness, agreeableness, openness to experience, all of those personality variables can also predict very well, but we can't change them. Mm -hmm. So what we try also to do is to go to HR and say, we can help you if you just take this seven item question, the questionnaire, we can help you um, figure out how best to kind of help people who you want to hire. And that's another nice way of doing things too. Yeah. So basically appeal to their business interest. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. W, you want to take a stab at this uh, challenges of uh, working well, with organizations? Let, let me just be be quite frank. I mean, where I am within within the business school is even more at a macro level, and we, we like to uh, in in strategy and organization look at all organizations, and it becomes very very difficult to really do controlled experiments at that level for all kinds of reasons, some of which have been mentioned, but also because you're just not going to get access to a, a lot of firms, uh, not the, the sort of numbers that you need to, uh, to do control things. So uh, a lot of what's happening in, in the fields where I am is a very advanced econometrics and trying to tease out sorts of certain things, but that is not going very much at the level of the behavioral detail that we are talking about here. So, so what we have really is, is not a lot of evidence-based substantiation for management practices, I would say. Uh, but I think that's a problem in all of the social sciences. It's a, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a problem to really, first of all, do experiments, controlled experiments, sometimes for ethical reasons, otherwise for reasons of access or just for, for getting enough of a sample. If you talk about whole organizations, getting enough of a sample is, is just not impossible. So it, we, we, we tend to work a little bit across levels of analysis, trying to piece together a story where what we know from the lab and what we know from the fields sort of, sort of is, is, has to be brought together. And actually, for me, one of the ways in which evolutionary reasoning can help is because it gives you this, this sort of paradigmatic view of things where you can begin to make meaningful connections between, between an individual case of one firm, a whole lot of interesting findings in the lab, and you can, you can start piecing together the picture of what this means for what we are as humans when we cooperate on a large scale and, and how to best organize this. And, and we're not there yet. We won't be for quite a while. But at least this evolutionary perspective hopefully can try to begin to integrate all of these different pieces of the puzzle much better than, than what we've been doing so far. Well, I like to remind people that the way Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize was by creating a database of common pool resource groups from a very diffuse literature. Uh, almost all of the accounts were descriptive. And nevertheless, that did not prevent her from coding them and analyzing them and then coming up with these core design principles, which could then be validated with a larger sample or with studies and so on and so forth. And really what's needed, uh, or I should say, if that was good enough for Ostrom for that particular kind of group, then it's good enough for other kinds of groups. And the literature, the business literature is incomparably richer than the literature on um, common pool of resource groups in terms of case reports and, and, uh, and data that's available, and, you know, public records and stock holdings and, and things like that. So, so at that level, there's a whole lot that can be done and uh, a whole data to mine, which can then, of course, be supplemented by more careful controlled studies. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it, and I'm so happy to make it available to a, a, large, uh, a large audience. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, and uh, I look forward to interacting with you in the future.